Hello! We're going to be using Noon Setting Daily Prayer, page 296 in the Lutheran Service Book. Name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen to my prayer, O God, do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Psalm for today will be Psalm 22, and this will be um, verses 1 to 19. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, in you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb, you made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, the strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our reading for, for today's meditation is John chapter 19, verses 23 to, to uh, 27. Oh, sorry, uh, to, to 29, I mean. 23 to 29. Uh, this will be focusing on um, a couple specific instances at the crucifixion, uh, not necessarily as... Well, actually, some of them are kind of focused on by the other Gospels. Um, but John is not focusing on all the different things that the other Gospels are, are focusing on, and I'll get into that in the, after, after I read through it. But uh, this forms some connection to, to prophecies in the Old Testament. So John chapter 19, verses 23 to 29. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. The coat was without seam, woven throughout, and they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots who should have it. This was to fulfill the scripture that says, They parted my garments among them, and for my coat did cast lots. And the soldiers did such things indeed. Then there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her from his, for his own. After that, when Jesus perceived all these things were performed, so that the scripture would be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. 
There was standing nearby a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and wound it about with hyssop, and put it to his mouth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, I will actually be focusing on the significance of Jesus' mother and the disciple who is unnamed, taking her into his house in a future devotion. But for now, I will be focusing on basically the fulfillment of some of the prophecies in the Old Testament right here, because uh, towards the end, in verse 28, it says, After that, when Jesus perceived all, the, all things were performed so that the scripture would be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Um, so at that time, we see that there are many Old Testament prophecies that are, have been fulfilled. John does not get into as many as them as some of the other gospel writers will actually get into. Uh, some of the gospel, other gospel writers will be mentioning uh, this happened so that would be fulfilled, or this, this scripture reminded them of that. And this happens throughout all of them, and I, and I don't remember if all of them overlap in, in terms of who's saying what is fulfilled where. Uh, but for the most part, they all agree on a few different things. All of them agree with the soldiers dividing Jesus' clothing. So all the gospel writers comment on that. Not all of them comment on uh, Jesus receiving vinegar at, at the cross. Uh, some of them don't comment about this because they're trying not to draw um, as much focus to the vinegar as as they would like, uh, because the vinegar at this time is mixed with wine, so it's a vinegary wine, and, and sometimes wine can degrade into vinegar. So the other gospel accounts, which have an account of the words of institution where Jesus says, this bread is my body, this this cup of wine is my blood. Um, they're also bringing up that he was receiving wine because uh, Jesus said after, in the Gospel of Luke, after, after, after the Lord's Supper, that he would not taste of the fruit of the vine again until he enters into his kingdom. So Luke makes a mention specifically that uh, Jesus had wine mixed with vinegar at the cross because Jesus is entering into his kingdom at the cross, that he's ascending to the Father. Um, for John, that's not necessarily his point. His points are looking towards the fulfillment of Scripture in only a couple different directions. But in, in terms of being put up on a cross, that was one of John's main images that he was using, even one of the main ones that Jesus himself was using, uh, because this was told through, uh, uh, in light of uh, the bronze serpent on a cross that Moses raised up in the desert. This is Numbers chapter 21, where the Israelites rebelled against God, they were bitten by serpents, and in order to live, they look upon a, a bronze serpent lifted high upon uh, on, a, on a stick uh, between them and God. And when they look upon the serpent, they are healed. Basically, when they look upon the symbol of their evil, the evil being done to them, being lifted up uh, between them and God, that their evil is now being destroyed. So uh, being lifted up is a sign of uh, death and destruction. So when Jesus is lifted up, he is being destroyed for the sins of the people. And when people look at Jesus on the cross, they live through him by faith. Um, the specific prophecies, however, that John is listing in this short section are actually dealing with the Psalms, not, not necessarily with the Torah, the five books of Moses at the beginning of the Bible, or the prophets. The prophets are the ones who would be um, recounting the history of Israel as well as specific points in time in the history of Israel. So the section of the prophets in the Old Testament not only includes uh, the major prophets, the minor prophets, minus Daniel, because Daniel is considered a part of another section in the Old Testament, but the all the books named after, the, after prophets, but also a lot of the history books, because the history books contained the prophets, so you'd also get um, Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, uh, those would also be counted as part of the section of the prophets because you have many prophets kind of, uh, recounted in those. Um, for example, Elijah is considered to be one of the greatest prophets of all time in, in the Old Testament, and he only occurs in 
uh, 1 Kings at the beginning of 2 Kings. So um, to account for the prophets, you go there. What we're actually going to be focusing on is the third category in the Old Testament, which is called the writings. The writings is basically a, a collection of everything that comes not of the five books of Moses and not of the books of the prophets. So these were all the other books that were inspired and, and occurred in the Old Testament. So this is, would be where Daniel would actually appear, would be in, in the category of the writings. And you would also get um, other short histories in there. That's where you would fit Ruth, Esther, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah. You would also find in there First and Second Chronicles, because those came later than First and Second Kings. Um, uh, you'd also find predominantly like the, the, the books of poetry. So not only uh, Job, Ecclesiastes, these Proverbs, Song of Songs, you'd also you have uh, Lamentations in there. But most importantly, you have the Psalms. Psalm, Psalms were the prayer book of the Old Testament. So Psalms were, had a very key role within the devotional life of the individual, as well as corporate worship, because Priests would be singing these psalms as they practice their work. In fact, sometimes the category of the writings of the Old Testament is just called the psalms in the New Testament. So when Jesus says, the psalms speak of me, he's talking about not only the book psalms, but he's talking about the writings in general. Um, this would definitely include, say, like the book of Daniel, because Jesus' favorite term for himself, his, his favorite title that he uses, the Son of Man, actually comes from Daniel chapter 7. So when Jesus is talking about the Psalms speaking of him, then he's referring not just to the Psalms, but entire category of literature. But the Psalms are very important because this is something that every Hebrew should know to some extent and should be practicing to some extent. Uh, within our own worship nowadays, we try to practice the Psalms um, religiously. <laughs> I know better. Uh, but we try to practice the Psalms quite often. So a worship service, a divine service, will typically have a psalm in it somewhere. Um, or at least if you're doing certain part, portions of the liturgy, you'd have uh, sections of psalms, multiple psalms in there. So if you have an intro, it usually that's derived from, from the Psalms. If you have a Psalm of the Day, you would have that somewhere. If you have a gradual, and the gradual is usually in between the Old Testament and the Epistle reading, the gradual, about half the time, is based on, on the Psalm, at least in, in part. Um, usually, uh, some of the other pieces of the liturgy, you focus on the Psalms, so... Uh, the offertory is a psalm, usually, or part of a psalm, and certain other portions as well. So psalms are very, very important. So when we're also looking for scriptural prophecy, we can also find this in, in psalms. So the reason why I was reading part of Psalm 22 is that uh, this is the psalm that is being fulfilled in, in this section of John. So for Psalm 22, people will definitely remember Jesus saying, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or in, in the Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sekbaktani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is why people are confused and saying, ah, he's calling Elijah, because Elijah would be uh, kind of Elias, in, in, um, or Eliah in in Aramaic, which is similar to Eloi. So, um, again, yeah, Elijah one of the, is renowned as one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. So, when, so they just assume that Jesus is not necessarily calling about God, but about Elijah. But uh, Jesus, when he's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually quoting this psalm. And the psalm is, uh, when you read it, basically recounting the crucifixion and also looking forward towards the resurrection, that even though there's much horror in this psalm, where the, the one who's speaking the psalm, the psalmist, they are undergoing all this type of suffering, uh, they remain in God's trust, and they basically conclude the, the, the psalm by saying, well, yeah, 
Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it, that he has redeemed uh, and remembered the people who are persecuted in this world. So Jesus, when he's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not only talking about being forsaken upon the cross, that is, he feels like he's abandoned by God and suffering all manner of evils, but you continue on in the psalm to the end, seeing that, well, no, God has promised prosperity. So even though we see different things being fulfilled through the psalms, uh, the point of the psalms coming to us is to actually look upon our Lord Jesus Christ and recognize that we have salvation in him because God has saved Jesus Christ. So even though we are experiencing all sorts of evils, and the psalms really do talk about all sorts of evils afflicting the people of God, we know that we do still have salvation in our God because of our Lord Christ Jesus. Now, one of the specific prophecies is being fulfilled in our reading for John chapter 19, where it says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, went to every soldier apart, and also his coat. The coat was without seam woven throughout. And they said to one another, Let us not tear it out, but cast lots who should have it. Now, this was to fulfill the scripture that says, they parted my garments among them, and for my coat did they cast lots. So that's specifically uh, Psalm 22, verse 18, where it says, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So Jesus, when he's also saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually referencing the psalm so people can actually go, oh, hey, look. This guy who's being crucified, his, his garments are being divided, just like in the psalm that he's quoting. Oh no, he is the Son of God. And, and, and <laughs> yeah, that, that's more or less the point, is that this is to fulfill the scriptures. Um, the reason why I continued well beyond this point, not just thinking of the soldiers dividing his clothing, that is, they are trying to take advantage of somebody's death. And... To a degree, this is what the soldiers did every single time when you have a crucifixion or some sort of execution because the soldiers could get extra money for tearing these clothes apart or they could just get clothing for themselves because uh, clothing at that period in time was at a premium. So you odds are you had uh, one set of clothes and you'd be wearing these until they wore out and then you get another set of clothes so you'd be wearing clothes for years at a time. Clothes were very expensive at the way back when. Uh, also why they could tear certain clothes in four pieces, because uh, if only part of your garment wore out and you still wanted to keep the rest of it, uh, you would just replace part of that garment and then continue on. So they could, so they tore apart one in four pieces, but the coat, which was woven in one piece, not mix and match or patched up but just woven together, they actually had to cast lots in order to, re to, uh, to receive it. But anyways, um, the reason why I extended the reading on to Jesus saying, to saying, I thirst, after he perceived all things had been fulfilled, he said, I thirst, and then he received vinegar. Uh, this is actually probably St. John giving a marginal reference to Psalm 69, uh, verse 21, which says, They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Uh, psalm 69 is another psalm which talks about a lot of suffering. In fact, it it opens up with, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause. Those who seek to destroy me, I am forced to restore what I did not steal. So Jesus is forced to make restitution for events outside of his own actions. So Jesus is not dying for his sins. He, he's perfect. He has not committed any crime. In fact, he's the one who's trying to call people out of their sins, out of their crimes. But the sinfulness of the world has 
basically put Jesus to reconcile with the community that which he does not need to reconcile. Um, so when Jesus goes to a cross, it can't be for his sake because he doesn't have anything to pay for. So if Jesus is paying his life for us upon the cross, it actually has to be, sorry, if he's paying his life upon the cross, it can't be for itself, it's for us. So we actually um, are the ones restored. We were not uh, stolen away by Christ, but we stole ourselves away in the sense that we sold ourselves into sin by enact, uh, acting in sin. So Jesus, if he's trying to restore us, he has to pay for our sins upon the cross. And that's kind of the beginning of what Psalm 69 is looking at, is that there is a lot of suffering and a lot of uh, punishment being paid. But we recognize that this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ and that he is saving us. Um, a signal that we see with, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Uh, and in fact, this is a psalm that comes up earlier in the Gospel of John. So when Jesus is clearing the temple at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, this is John chapter 2, Jesus is casting out all these sellers. He's trying to remove all these people who are uh, only breeding greed and evil in the place so that worship go back as usual, that people can go back to focusing on God and their salvation. And uh, the disciples, when they think back on this moment, they remember from Psalm 69, zeal for your house consumes me and the insults of those who insult you follow me. So uh, they're remembering Psalm 69 that, oh, Jesus is fulfilling this psalm. When we look at the crucifixion, later on in the Gospel of John, we're also connected to the point where they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. So Jesus is fulfilling these psalms, that he is actually going to the cross for the salvation of all. And we find Jesus Christ not just in certain prophecies in the Old Testament, uh, but we see him in even some of the more mundane stuff, like he, even the bronze serpent upon a, upon a pike. Like You wouldn't necessarily think that's an image of Christ, but Jesus applies that image to himself in John chapter 3. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily think about the Messiah drinking vinegar to satisfy his thirst to be a fulfillment of, of uh, uh, Jesus Christ, but you find that in the Psalms. Uh, even when you're trying to expand things out beyond that, all of Old Testament worship is really surrounded upon Christ. Christ is the foundation of Old Testament worship. Um, if you're at all curious about this, please go look at the numerous devotions I did about the tabernacle from Exodus, well, uh, chapters 24, basically to the end of the book of, of Exodus. There's a few gaps in there where there, there's stuff not um, focusing on the tabernacle primarily. But yes, basically chapters 24 and on in, in the book of Exodus, you will you will hear me talk about the tabernacle and how this looks forward to Christ and uh, reflects God. So all the Old Testament is really pointing forward to Christ. So God has known since the Old Testament, the writing of the Old Testament, even well before the writing of the Old Testament, that we need a Savior. <laughs> there will come a point when somebody has to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, in terms of the suffering they're experiencing, so that all of us who are suffering rightfully because of our sin, because if we sin, we are facing good punishment. That is, um, for justice to be done, sinners must be punished according to their sins. So you're looking forward to uh, somebody suffering unrighteously, that is, he is himself righteous, so if he's experiencing punishment, it cannot be for his own sin. We are seeing him suffer for those who deserve the punishment. And this is true of the Old Testament, and it's true for us today. Uh, we don't necessarily need to look back to any specific prophecies so that we can look forward to a future Messiah, future salvation. 
um, in the sense that Jesus Christ fulfilled all things upon the cross. In fact, that's what's coming up in verse 30 of the Gospel of John chapter 19, where Jesus says that it is finished. But we are looking back to the person of Jesus Christ and saying we are saved in him. There is suffering in this world. We can empathize with uh, all the psalmists who are speaking of the horrors they've experienced because those same horrors are coming to us now, that we are facing persecution in the faith. We are facing um, sufferings in the world. We are seeking uh, death and old age and sickness and all these other things attack our flesh. Uh, we are experiencing all these horrors. But we know that Jesus Christ, who has come and who has shared in our suffering, that he has come to bear the weight of suffering and death upon himself, that through Christ, we are actually saved. We can see in Christ that he has fulfilled all these things and he has surpassed all these things. He did not remain dead, nor does he remain in suffering, but he has come into paradise, that he has uh, gone up to the Father in his death and also in the ascension, and he is enjoying life without the complications of sin. He is no longer himself suffering because of sin, but in fact is mediating for those who are suffering because of the sinfulness in the world so that we don't have to remain in the suffering but actually have eternal life. So now we are currently awaiting Jesus Christ to come down with paradise so that we can join him in eternal blessings. All these things are prefigured in the Old Testament. We see these in the Psalms. We see these in the uh, Book of Numbers, the Prophets. Um, you see these everywhere because God wants us to know that we are indeed saved. Amen. Uh, let us continue. Page 296 with the Kyrie. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God Almighty, we thank and praise you for sending to us Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, that we may have salvation in him. We also thank and praise you for the entirety of the scriptures which speak of Christ so that we know concretely that he is the fulfillment of all the prophecies that you have been speaking over the millennia and that we can have assurance that he is our salvation in this world. Bless us, O Lord, with grace and the faith that we might continue in the word always receiving the salvation that Jesus Christ promises to us by way of this cross. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to direct and rule us according to your will, to comfort us in all our afflictions, to defend us from all error, and to lead us into all truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.